Greetings. Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, verse 101. So we began this free online course on the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra about two years ago now. And we have completed 100 verses out of 162. And uh, so progress has been a little slower than originally anticipated, but I'm happy to say that each verse has received the fullest treatment and analysis ever before uh, in, in the English language, or has received a fuller treatment than has ever uh, occurred before, and presumably it'll be surpassed again. Um, as the saying goes, when you stand on the shoulders of giants, even if you're a dwarf, you see a little bit farther. <laughs> so that's why that's part of why we can confidently say this is the most um, thorough treatment. Others can debate whether it's the most accurate, of course I think it is, but it, it's certainly the most thorough treatment of the verses of this sacred scripture, the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, which was composed by an unknown author uh, probably in Kashmir in maybe the year 900 of our calendar. Okay, so verse 101 is a great verse, a very special verse, a beautiful verse, a very important practice, and a fundamental practice. So I think it's, uh, it's delightful that it's 101 in the uh, American University system. The, entry-level course is always 101, like, you know, Literature 101 or whatever. And this is Tantric Yoga 101, and you'll see why in this particular verse. So the verse reads in the original Sanskrit, Kama Krodha Lobha Moha Madha Matsarya Gochare Buddhim nistimitam kritva tatatvam avashishyate. Which in English, in my translation, reads When in the field of craving, anger, greed, confusion, intoxicated excitement, or jealousy, make the mind still and soft right in the middle of the emotion or experience. Reality is that which remains throughout the experience and after it fades. So yeah, I think it's fair to say this is a fundamental practice of Tantric Yoga and uniquely of Tantric Yoga. We don't find this practice in non-Tantric Yogas uh, we don't find this sort of practice in, you know, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra and similar such texts, which really invite the practitioner to reject, or at least transcend, which is a kind of rejection, his or her emotional being altogether. And we don't find that teaching here. We find, in fact, an embrace in Tantric Yoga of all that makes us human. And yet there's still spiritual work to do. And if there wasn't, we'd all already be self-realized, awakened, liberated beings. So the work here is while not pushing away the emotion, while not uh, re rejecting or demonizing the experience, we nonetheless seek a deeper reality. So it's very different from the transcendentalist meditative enterprise of classical Patanjalian yoga and other such systems like uh, Vedanta because we're not seeking to transcend the human experience but we are seeking a deeper version of it a more fulfilling version of it a version of our human experience which remains ever wedded to our essence nature to the sort of deepest level of our being, the fundamental ground of our being. So that's what this verse is hinting at in very simple language. So let's take the first line. 
when in, in the field, gochara means a field, you know, like you, you find yourself in the middle of um, this experience, you know, and it might be big, <laughs> it might be a big field. Um, and what experiences? Well, several examples are given, six examples, but, you know, it covers more than this too. These are just examples. So kama means craving or desire, can mean infatuation, could mean sexual desire as well. Krodha means anger. Moha means confusion um, or delusion. Bewilderment. Uh, loba, sorry, skipped loba, means uh, greed or or avarice. Mada means intoxication. It could be intoxication from substances, but more likely just here means intoxicated excitement. Um, matsarya means jealousy or envy. So these are the examples that are given. You know, these are so-called negative emotions, most people would say, but the same principle can apply with any emotional experience whatsoever. It's just that these examples are given because these are the emotional experiences that people tend to find problematic, that they think they need help with. But the practice could actually be done in the middle of any intense experience. Um, so the practice, what is the practice? Well, the practice is, itself is given in three words. Buddhim nistimitam kritva. Make the mind nistimitam. So we'll talk about that word. Uh, and, and by the way, the word for mind here is buddhi, which, it, you know, it's important to note the word buddhi is being used in a general sense. It's a general word for mind here. It's not... Uh, the intellect or anything, it's just mind, okay? So make the mind nistimita. Now this is the key word of the verse and yet it's problematic uh, for a translator because this word is not found in the Sanskrit dictionaries. Uh, now how do we figure it out then? Well it has a prefix, ni. So the word stimita is found in the Sanskrit dictionaries. Stimita means um, still and soft. It means more than that as well. It means um, fixed, motionless, still, calm, tranquil, soft, and gentle. So that's quite a beautiful word. But what does the prefix ni add here? Well, we don't know. We don't know what the author had in mind. Again, this word is unattested in our dictionaries. I haven't checked all the dictionaries. I should do that, but in the major ones, we don't find it. So for now, we just go with the meaning um, uh, of stimita. We assume nistimita is a synonym uh, with stimita, which again means something like still and soft, but also steady. Right? There's this strong connotation of keeping it steady, um, motionless, but also softening and being still, uh, still in a, a deeper sense, right? So obviously motionless, but also in the sense of like feeling into the stillness which lies beneath the experience without trying to escape the experience. Okay, so... I just translated, make the mind still and soft. Right there, right in the middle of the experience. Okay, So it's very important in this practice that you're not trying to escape the experience, sidestep it, or handle it. People say, how do I handle these feelings? Well, that's asking the wrong question. You don't handle them. It's not what you do with feelings. <laughs> you um, make the mind, or you could even say awareness here, still and soft, right in the middle of the experience. So you relax and soften. You don't try to process the, the experience. You don't try to handle it. You don't try to sublimate it. You don't do anything. You just realize, oh, in the middle of the experience, if I let awareness or mind, however you're 
experiencing it. If, if I let awareness be still and soft, then I can feel this underlying stillness in the midst of this intense experience. You know, so breathing helps. You know, we've all experienced intense infatuation. I think almost all of us, where you just you just want somebody to say yes to you to to romance or or sexual activity or connection or or um, relationship you want it so bad that it's just an absolutely intense experience. it's burning it's a burning experience you know and whether it's that whether it's the burning of anger whether it's greed like greed here means you really you think you really need something you don't have you know so we think of greedy like the villain in a movie or the Grinch or whatever no no it's, this is the real human experience that's much more common is you're desperate to get something you don't have you're maybe even willing to um, screw other people over to get it that's what we mean by greed so it's a kind of desperate wanting you know um, or confusion or uh, excitement, right, or intoxication, any of these experiences, you make the mind still and soft right in the middle of it, and there can be this opportunity to sort of drop down deeper, drop down deeper, and feel the stillness. But it's important, again, you're not trying to escape the experience, or else you're just going into a kind of trance-like state, a meditative trance state, right? Now, this doesn't require any meditation you know, a technique or posture or anything like that. You can, you can do this right in the middle of a crowded supermarket. You can do this in a protest. You can do this on a phone call. You can do this anywhere as long as you can take a few, just a couple of minutes. Make the mind still and soft right in the middle of the experience. And then, then there's, there is another step to the practice uh, that's implied, not explicitly stated. Because then we get the phrase, Tat, tatwam of a shishite. Reality is that which remains. So that invites our attention. That invites us to pay attention to something. And that is, what is it that remains? What is it that stays present? And the answer is not anything you could say in words, right? You, I mean, you could say the self or consciousness, but those are already abstractions. Those are already mental concepts. And what we're talking about here is a direct sensing of that aspect of being that remains through the experience and after it dies away. So you've made the mind still and soft, you could say attention, mind, consciousness, whatever. <laughs> make, make it still and soft right in the middle of the experience. And let the experience unfold. Let the wave of emotion crest and crash and recede again. And maybe another wave comes, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it just recedes. And But stay, stay there, because that's the important part, because most of us were like, oh, whew, okay. <laughs> That's uh, just about over. Okay, now what? No, no. Stay present and notice there's some aspect of you, of your being, that was there the whole time and it's there as the experience fades. Tatwam avashishyate. What is it that remains? The great, great meditation master, non dual. Um, sage Ramana Maharshi said thoughts come and go feelings come and go experiences come and go memories come and go desires come and go fears come and go find out what remains find out what it is that remains could almost have had this verse in mind, although he wasn't exposed to tantric materials, sadly. Everyone interpreted him as a Vedantin, because that's what was available at that time. 
uh, in his cultural time and place. But uh, if he had had access to this, <laughs> you know, he might have quoted this, and people would have been, ah, oh, he's a tantrika. Right? But a great master like that, he's not a sect. He's not doesn't belong to any sect. He's just speaking the truth. So he said, find out what remains. So that's key. You don't need to change the kind of experience you're having. I mean, it'll change on its own, no problem. But you don't need to try to change the kind of experience you're having. You need to discover what's always already there at a deeper level. And this is absolutely key. to. This is what distinguishes spirituality from self-help and from pop psychology, from self-improvement books, you know. They're always trying to tell you how you can be better, which obviously implies you're not good enough, as you are. There's something wrong with you, and it needs to be fixed. And we'll help you fix it for only $9.99. That is how an industry gets built on implicit human self-hatred. This is different. Spirituality is different. Fundamentally, it's not telling you how to change your experience. It's telling you how to discover a deeper dimension to your experience, which is always already there. And then, yes, your experience will tend to change. You probably will be happier. But there's something much more important than happiness. It's depth of presence. It's meaning. Right? That which, when discovered makes the coming and going of happiness and pleasure absolutely fine. The coming and going even of pain, absolutely fine. So yes, we all want more happiness, and um, the, the spiritual tradition doesn't fail to address that topic, but in Tantra at least, they very clearly say that is ancillary, that is secondary, because any degree of happiness, any frequency of happiness, still won't fulfill you if you haven't discovered the deeper dimension of human life. So, if you keep getting focused on how to change your experience, if you keep going to teachers and therapists, how can I have a different experience? Can you help me have a different experience? Can you make my experience different? <laughs> can you tell me the trick that will uh, undo this this mode and and launch me into a different mode of being as if by magic no the answer is no you can change your experience with work over time but if the fundamental underlying motive is the conviction the subconscious conviction that you're not good enough it won't work it's not sustainable and it doesn't allow you to become fulfilled so trying to hack human life, trying to be better at it, trying to be shinier, doesn't fulfill even if you succeed in finding out the tips and tricks, even if you succeed in how to hack human life as far as everyone can see, people looking at you, whoa, they really did it, you know, they really hacked it. You're still, inside you're not fulfilled if you haven't discovered this deeper dimension of your own being that's always already right there waiting, as it were, for you to see it. Now that's metaphorical language because it's actually your essence nature. It's the deepest aspect of your own being. So you never see it. You never see it as an object. It's impossible, right? And that's part of why spirituality is so subtle, <laughs> you know, because we keep looking for the truth, we keep looking for the true self, the higher self, God, you never find it because it's not an object, it is the place from which all seeing is done, the deepest place though, the root of consciousness itself, right? So this verse gives us a key. So in the middle of that emotional experience, there's a few um, little tips that help. Relax the jaw. Relax the face. Come into this, your center. Get still and quiet. Don't try to escape the experience. Feel it fully, but 
Let your mind, let your awareness be still and soft in the center. Like the eye of the hurricane. And now pay attention. What is it that's here underneath the experience and continues to be here as the experience fades? Discover it for yourself. No words that I could give to it could ever do it justice. You must look and see for yourself and feel it and sense it for yourself. So I'll chant the verse one more time. Kama krodha lobha moha Mada matsarya gochare Buddhim nistimitam kritva Om. May this practice bear great fruit for you and thereby benefit all beings in your life. I want to warmly thank all the patrons on Patreon that make these free courses possible. They've been um, supporting this work for three years now, and uh, they're very loyal and kind and generous, and uh, we couldn't do it. I couldn't <laughs> do anything without them, anything meaning uh, any substantial percentage of this work. Um, that I do because of their support. So that um, makes a lot possible. And also through the support of the patrons on Patreon, I'm able to um, employ a couple of assistants uh, who absolutely are, are crucial and instrumental and are helping to um, facilitate the projects that are happening and the books that are coming. So that's all. Uh, made possible by the support of the patrons. Feel free to become a patron if you like, and uh, thank you those of you who already are. Om. Um.